for hopping on and joining us today. I really think that we are go all going to benefit greatly from the discussions being held today. I also wanted to give a very special thank you to Ms. Sylvia Taylor, our guest speaker today. So Sylvia is actually the environmental account manager at IMA, and she's been gracious enough to bless us with her presence today and just lead us in a, a really beneficial uh, discussion regarding diversity, inclusion, equity, and the such. So thank you so much, Ms. Sylvia. I do, really do appreciate your time with us here today. So how we're going to conduct this meeting today, guys, is we're going to uh, we're going to be starting off today with a quick Kahoot game. Um, for those of you that haven't used Kahoot or been exposed to it, it's really simple to use. It's just going to be basically a uh, interactive trivia game for us to kind of get a baseline understanding of where we all are regarding our knowledge and experience with diversity and inclusion. Uh, once we finish the Kahoot game, we will give the floor to Miss Sylvia Taylor to lead us in our discussion today, and then we'll round out the meeting by breaking out into some breakout rooms with some uh, lead discussions with questions. So we'll go ahead and get rocking and rolling, guys. I'm gonna open up this Kahoot game real quick and I will be sharing my screen with everybody. It's gonna show you a meeting ID and a website to join onto the Kahoot game. So let me share my screen. All righty. So if you guys don't mind going to www.kahoot.it, and then all you'll have to do is enter in that game pin that's shown at the top of the screen right there. Once you enter that game pin, your name should show up over here in the lobby. Also be pretty divisive. You see, there's more to patriotism than flag sequin onesies and rodeos and quadruple cheeseburgers. Patriotism is love for a country, not just pride in it. But what really makes up this country of ours? What is it we love? More than just a huge rock full of animals like cougars and eagles, right? It's the people. Do me a favor. Close your eyes for a second. I want to tell you something. Picture the average U.S. citizen. Think about it. Looks like we just got a couple more people that need to join on real quick. Got one? Okay. The chances are the person you're picturing right now looks a little different than the real average American. There are 319 million U.S. citizens. 51% are female. So first off... All righty. Everybody joined into the game that is uh, wanting to participate. Anyone having any issues, you should see a screen. It's purple. It says you're in if you're all the way in. Sweet. I think we're good to go, Caleb, whenever you want Perfect, to Perfect, guys. Let's rock and roll with it. I'll start the game up. And I will also read the questions out for, for all of us as well. All righty. First question. The unconscious assumptions we make about others based on their identity labels is called, and we have answers of racism, implicit bias, hate, or inequity. If you haven't played Coop before, you probably caught this, but just click the correlating um, color on your screen from what you see on Caleb's screen. There we go. We did a great job on that one, guys. Awesome. Yes. So the unconscious assumptions that we make about others based on their identity labels is called implicit bias. Awesome. Good job, guys. Let's see here. All righty. Second question. We do blank of our thinking in our subconscious mind where we collect and store implicit biases.
Ding, ding, ding. Looks like that one was a little bit harder for us, guys. But yes, we do do 98% of our thinking, our subconscious mind, where we collect and store implicit bias. So a lot of this is going on in the background, out of the, out of the forefront conscious. I'm not sure why it's not keeping score for us. but So third question, guys. Our personal biases can be shaped by either our culture our life experience or the media? Ooh. There we go. So our personal biases can be shaped by our, all of them looks like, <laughs> there we go. Alrighty, so why does implicit bias matter? Is it because it influences how we treat and interact with each other? Is it because it can perpetuate disparities? Is it because it can alter people's ability to find a job or secure a loan? Or is it because it can alter the ability to rent a home or get a fair trial? Ding, ding, ding. Great job on that one, guys. Awesome, awesome. So implicit bias matters because it influences how we treat and interact with each other. There we go. Oh, Harreen's on fire. Look, let's go. <laughs> so a generalization about a group, about a person or group without regard for individual differences is known as, is it xenophobia? Is it stereotype? Is it scapegoating? Or is it inequity? Stereotype. Great job, guys. Yes, generalization about a person or group without regard for individual differences is a stereotype. Jennifer with the answer streak. There we go. <laughs> now, what does it mean to be inclusive? Does it mean committing to support diverse social groups and identities, committing to represent diverse social groups and identities, committing to embrace diverse social groups and identities, or creating an environment where all people feel they belong. There we go. So yes, so to be inclusive is creating an environment where all people feel like they belong. I love all these answer street guys are doing great. There we go. So someone who speaks out on behalf of or takes actions that are supportive of others is called is that an ally, a bigot, name calling, or cyber bullying? That one was quick. <laughs> Good job, guys. I love it. Yes. Yeah, so an ally is someone who speaks out on behalf of or takes actions that are supportive of others. All righty, guys. Last question here. To fight bias and make the world a more inclusive, accepting, and equitable place, I can... Can you learn about a religion or culture different from your own? Seek out a, a diverse group of friends, avoid judging others based on stereotypes or research how to be a better ally. I really think all of these answers could be the right one. It, it looks like, you know, all these are, are a good way to go about making the world a more inclusive place. Absolutely. So thank you so much for participating that guys. I hope that kind of gives us a good little baseline of where we are as far as our past experience and knowledge with diversity and equity. So with that being done, we will go ahead and pass the floor now to Miss Sylvia Taylor uh, to take about the next 30 minutes. Uh, and the floor is yours, Miss Sylvia. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, Caleb. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for helping set this up and to the rest of the committee to just, you know, put this together and keep in mind how important this work is and to, you know, be willing and wanting to learn more um, on top of everything that you already have to learn being in college. So what I'm going to do is um, share a slide. I'm trying to find my mouse. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay. So let's change those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All 
right, so like Caleb said, my name is um, Silvia Mendoza Taylor, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I work for IMA. I have been with IMA for like three years and a month now. I started in the search team, and I did not come from insurance. I actually um, came from a sales uh, representative position in Texas. So coming into insurance has definitely definitely be, been an exciting opportunity. And I have been able to bring my experience in sales into my jobs here, uh, my different positions that I've held here at IMA. And it's been um, part of why diversity is important. Not so much because I am a woman or because I am Latina or because I grew up in Mexico and speak a different language than most people here, but because I also have different thoughts and opinions and just a different background as far as the industry goes. I used to sell food for a food distributor and uh, our clients were restaurants, um, hotels, schools, and the restaurants were either mom and pops or big chains. So, uh, definitely was able to bring a different perspective into the workplace. And there were a lot of transferable skills that were important to bring uh, to the table. So that's how I ended up here. And um, let's see, let's start this presentation. It's like starting it in my other, in my other screen. <laughs> and that, that other screen is to, I, have a lot of issues sharing from that one because it's very wide. So just, you know. You're totally good. Bear oh, with okay. me for a little bit. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm on and then we also have someone from our IT team on as well, if you have a question. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you. Swap. Okay. Oh, what is happening? All of my screens went went black. Oh no. Okay. There's oh, oh goodness. If it's easier, you can also email it to yep. me and I'd be happy to share for you. <laughs> what <One second. laughs> computer's freaking out. I'm so sorry. I we don't typically uh, use PowerPoint for our presentations with uh, with clients, um, so I'm just trying to understand why it's not just showing the one screen. All right, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna adapt and we're gonna go from here. Let's see. All right. Here we go. It doesn't matter that it's not full screen, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. Crisis averted. <laughs> okay. So, diversity, equity, and inclusion. First and foremost, um, what does the dictionary say? And before I keep on going, do you see yourselves here on the bottom from my screen? Or am I no. seeing me? Okay, I'll, I'll move you over here because it's, it's in the way. All right, so what does a dictionary say? For diversity, it's uh, the condition of having or being composed of different elements. Diversity includes, but it's not limited to um, race, gender, religion, sexual orientation physical ability, mental ability, um, your religion, your education level, your income, uh, your body size, your language. I mean, it, it just, you know, so many different things, including also thoughts, opinions, and just, you know, different points of views is considered diversity. And when, uh, when you have diversity somewhere, you might not necessarily retain, when, I, when we have diversity in the workplace, is what I meant to say, uh, we might not necessarily have uh, the tools to retain the employees. 
And how we do that is increasing equity and inclusion. So equity, uh, by definition, is justice according to natural law or right, specifically freedom from bias or favoritism. In other words, when a company acknowledges that there are differences in access or differences in background um, that provide advantages and disadvantages to different groups, it creates um, disparities for certain people. So a company would want to look through their processes and make sure that they're bringing people up uh, to where they need to be. There's a really good image that I wanted to share um, that represents this very well. So here we see on the left side, equality, and on the right side, equity, because that, those are two ter terms that sound very familiar and people often um, confuse them, uh, understandably. But equality would mean like everything is the same for everybody. However, as you can see, there are two people on the left, left side of the screen who cannot reach the fruits of the tree. However, on the right side, if you bring people up and you elevate them so that they can have the same access to these things, then everyone um, is represented uh, a little bit better than, than just having the same equal um, standing ground. Now, inclusion is the act of including and the state of being included. What does that mean in an organization? If, if an organization wants to be uh, inclusive, you want to be uh, respectfully listening to your employees, making sure that you understand where they're coming from and you take them into consideration for your decisions as far as processes, as far as policies, etc. cetera. Um, there's something else that it's, that's not on the screen that's important to also discuss. What uh, is belonging? Oftentimes, we're just concerned with bringing diversity. And in the last few years, we've been more concerned with inclusion and with equity. But something that has been coming up recently is belonging. Like, OK, it's cool that you might have um, people from different places, but does that mean, you know, is that actually helpful? So diver diversity could be considered, and I'm sure potentially you might have heard this analogy before. So diversity might be considered being invited to the party or being present at a party. And inclusion would be someone asking you, hey, do you want to dance? And like, you know, bringing you into the dance floor. Equity would be for example, building a ramp so that someone who is in a wheelchair or wearing crutches or something can get on the stage in order to dance and party with the rest of the people. Uh, and that's just one example out of many. You could, um, if someone uh, has a hearing disability, you could have an interpreter of American Sign Language right next to the front of the stage interpreting the music. So that's another way that you can bring equity into the party. And it definitely depends on what your needs are individually, uh, but all of these things can be um, brought so that you can enjoy the party just as much. And now belonging would be your favorite music also playing. So not only one type of music, but everyone's favorite music plays at some point throughout the party. And I hope that makes it a little bit clearer because I, I know that at the beginning, for me, it was like, okay, but what? What do you mean? <laughs> Is it not, you know, are you not including people when you're bringing a, a diverse workforce? But there are very specific ways of achieving these things in the workplace. Uh, some other, uh, buzzwords, I guess, uh, that I wanted to cover with you all today are intersectionality, microaggression, and unconscious bias. Intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group 
regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so in 1989, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw came up with this, um, with this terminology and she was saying how well, you know, women are discriminated and black people are discriminated but there's a compounding effect of being both a woman and being a black person because it creates even bigger disparities. So anything, um, any data that you look at whenever you disaggregate it and look at race, race is typically a multiplier, but also is, um, it typically that's the largest multiplier that, that is observed. However, if you combine that with being a woman with being, um, say you're trans and say you have a disability and, you know, a mental disability like ADHD or dyslexia, and you are also uh, utilizing a wheelchair to move around. So that would put you in such a, um, such a marginalized group. It would be very, very small. Um, there's also something that I wanted to share here um, is something that I use in some of my meetings uh, uh, for DEI. So this circle was created by um, Sylvia Duckworth. And I really like it because it's very colorful, but very, you know, you can really understand what is going on with all of these. Of course, there's not only 12 things where you can have intersectionality, but you can start with, you know, number one, okay, well, Sylvia is, uh, technically by the standards of the US or by, by law, I am technically considered white, though I do not see myself as white. Um, my ethnicity, so now when we're coming to circle, you know, number two is Latin American. Um, gender identity, circle number three, I identify as a female, uh, class and so on and so forth. So then, you know, you start going through the entire circle and you see how everything else touches as well. And you can be in different parts of this intersectionality. You could be uh, a white male, but you could have autism or you could, you know, um, you could come from a lower income or you could have very, um, um, you could be a Jew or, you know, so there's, there's different things that really change a person. It's not oftentimes things that we can see whenever we're looking at someone. So that is important to consider that it's not just race, gender, and sexual orientation as how it's often portrayed. Now, um, due to the different things that might or might not be visible, you might suffer from microaggression, which is a statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of indirect subtle or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group such as a racial or ethnic minority. For example, something that you might see in the workplace if you're a woman is that whenever you're giving a presentation to the client, perhaps the client um, might thank someone else in the room for the presentation and say, and you know, and by someone else, I mean a, a male, and say, oh, thank you so much for the presentation, even though the female was the one who gave the presentation. Um, and in, this is in, in these instances, it's important to be an ally, and it's important to know and understand where you stand. Because even if I, Sylvia, am not the person presenting, I can still be an upstander and notice that situation and say, oh yes, so-and-so did a really great job. Uh, thank you client uh, for your feedback. Um, if you have any questions, please refer them to so-and-so who is you know, the person who gave the presentation. So very subtly, but you know, cordially and respectfully correct the action and direct the credit back to the person who is should be receiving credit. Um, and sometimes the people who are marginalized might not want a 
savior per se. Um, so it's always important to allow them to, um, you know, have their the first response or first reaction. And it's and if you notice, oh, this person, you know, it's been a few seconds. I'm not sure they might say if they might respond or anything. All right, I'll you know I'll intervene and say you know thank you. Or if uh, you're meeting with with a vendor and the vendor shakes the hands of everyone except the person who is black and you know you can you know be on the lookout for those things and say oh and this is uh mr so-and-so or mrs so-and-so and you know this is their name they they do this in our team so you make sure that to to bring them to the table in that way there's no um this person won't feel like they're not being acknowledged and that nobody in their team is actually their teammate trying to look out for the entire team. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying you have to be from now on, you have to be on the lookout for every single transgression. Just, you know, if you notice it, um, you know, it might, you might have noticed things like this in school and, you know, it's not a matter of attacking anybody or saying, hey, how dare you, you are racist, or, you know, you don't care about women or whatever. It's not, you know, it's not that. It's just a matter of being cordial and saying, oh, hey, you know, this is my friend. And even if it's a, a white male who was not introduced, I think that that would just be the, um, the nice thing to do is to say, oh, hey, there's also this other person in our team. You know, it's not a matter of only um, defending or bringing others uh, to the table who are marginalized, but anybody who, who is being ignored. I, you know, I don't want this to sound like we're against white men, you know, because it's not that way. White, white men belong as well in the conversation, definitely, definitely do. And I believe that everyone, and, and I know that everyone is important and everyone brings good things to the table. So nobody should be left, left aside. Um, so why do these things happen? These things happen due to the unconscious bias, which you know was one of the, the questions uh, is also um, on the Kahoot quiz. And this is also known as implicit bias and is often defined as prejudice or unsupported judgments in favor of or against one thing, person, or group as compared to another in a way that is usually considered unfair. For example, um, I went to Texas A&M University in Texas, of course, and I, um, in, from alumni at Texas A&M really stick together after graduation. So there's often like clubs everywhere. There's actually a club here in Denver. And anytime that I go to these events from, you know, alumni events with my husband, who happens to be a blonde male, people typically, you know, reach out and say hello to him first and ask him, oh, hey, what year did you graduate? Nice to meet you. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I, I didn't go to Texas and I'm, I'm actually from North Carolina. Da, 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 da. And it's just, you know, people don't do it on purpose, but it's the unconscious bias that they think it's, a, you know, him, he is the one who went to Texas A&M because he looks like what most people, um, not anymore, but at, you know, a few years back, most people looked like him at the campus. And it's funny because I'm the one wearing the Aggie ring, uh, and the, we, ca we call ourselves Aggies. And you know, it's, it's not intentional. Typically people are not wanting to be offensive. Typically people are not um, out to get you is just something that happens because their brain makes associations that tells them, oh, well, out of these two people, which one is more likely, from my experience, to be the one who attended this college? Oh, the white male. So, you know, it automatically makes that decision. It's not a thought out process of, I'm not going to shake her hand. It's just more than likely he is the one who went to AM, which is not necessarily true. And those assumptions can be damaging because that is something that happens to me 
all the time. <laughs> so anytime I go to an event, you know, an alumni event with, with him, it's, it's bound to happen. Like someone's bound to ask him what year he graduated is and not, you know, consider me or ask me. So I, I have to be very assertive, but also it's just a little tire, tiring that everyone makes the same assumptions. Um, but moving along to our next slide, we're going to chat here about the ways that DEI positively impacts insurance. So why is this important for you to, to know about, for you to learn about, for anybody or any company to be aware of? So number one, it reflects a diverse population. You wouldn't want to have a business that doesn't look like what the country looks like. I feel like that is very um, common knowledge <laughs> and it should be natural for everyone to realize that this is important to have a similar representation of the actual, at least the area where you're at, if not, you know, the state or, you know, the country in general and, um, to know that you're providing those opportunities for people. Now, number two will be deepening customer relationships. So if you have, if I, Silvia, have a customer of um, Seguros Rodriguez or something, um, we are potentially going to bond uh, over our shared experiences if we have the, share, the same background. Now, we might not have the same background, it could be that this person um, has been here in the U.S. with their family ever since Colorado was a part of Mexico. So they might just have the last name, but not really have the culture. So they might not necessarily feel like they can relate to me, a person who just came from uh, Mexico, like what, like 12 years ago or so. So, you know, it's not an obvious assumption either to say, oh, because Sylvia is from Mexico, Sylvia should uh, take care of all the clients who are Mexicans. That's also not the way, but it does help with the relationships that do, um, that do have the capability of deepening because of that shared uh, background. Say, you know, if someone is in Kansas City uh, or someone grew up in Kansas City and then we have a client who's from Kansas City, they, they can you know, talk about football or they can talk about whatever thing is happening in Kansas City and just bond a little bit more. Uh, number three would be diverse perspectives uh, equal diverse solutions. So if you bring a team and everyone thinks the same things and everyone can finish each other's sentences, then you're really not going to be innovating. You're only going to continue doing the same things because this is what we've always done. And even if you bring people who are diverse, it, uh, I, I said the thing that I always tell people not to say. <laughs> so if, even if you brought in the pool of candidates and you bring more people uh, to the table and you increase the diversity of your team, um, you could still fall into groupthink because this person might not feel like they can disagree with others because the culture is so strong, or they might have had experiences where their voices were not heard, so they were not being included in the conversation and their opinions were not valued. So you might end up having, even though you could have a diverse um, set of employees, you could still end up with, um, employees who don't share their views because they don't feel like they can, they don't feel like they can bring, bring the, their authentic selves or bring suggestions to the table. But once you do accept other people's opinions and build upon them and build together, then it will bring up diverse solutions and you will be much more innovative in the way that you do business. And it doesn't have to be necessarily a product, it can be a service like the insurance industry and um, that's definitely going to increase your profits as well. Number four would be attracting and retaining your best employees. This is very much tied to what, what I have been saying. If you feel like your voice is valued and like people take your thoughts and opinions into serious consideration, 
even if they don't end up utilizing or doing what you said, but they listened to you and they carefully considered it and they, you know, and you came together to a conclusion that, well, this might not be the best solution, you're going to feel like you are making a, an impact in that you are a valued employee of the, um, of the company, thus your loyalty to the company and your employee satisfaction will be greater. Number five will be inspiring a culture of loyalty and community. Again, you know, it's very much tied to what I have said uh, already of people feeling like they can be themselves, people feeling like, hey, in this company, I can develop into the best version of myself, which is something that you'll do for the rest of your life. And, you know, I can grow with them. So definitely a, a positive impact. Number six would be providing access to programs with uh, diversity mandates. For example, in California, you have to have, I can't remember exactly what the number is, but you have to have a certain number of women in your board. So if you had already had women in your board, instead of only, only uh, people who identify as male, then you would be able to get certain grants or you would be able to get certain things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get. So if the government, government or any organization is mandating that you um, adhere to certain diversity standards, then you might already be able to uh, comply with these mandates instead of just like, well, we only have men and that's all we do. <laughs> um, and, you know, honestly, in, in my personal opinion, it's just the right thing to do. But I understand that we are in the business environment, so we want to know the numbers. And, and as such, this is uh, as the slide with the numbers, the diversity boost. So number one, uh, well, you know, uh, I'll share a number of the impact of gender diversity. This is a study made by um, McKinsey Company, and they uh, gathered up, to, I think it was like about a thousand companies and they have been following them since 2014 until 2020, which was when this report was issued. And well, until 2019, and then the report was issued in 2020. Uh, facts are important. <laughs> so they've been looking at them and they've been comparing, comparing them to each other, comparing their benchmarks for financial success, as well as comparing what the makeup of the company is in different areas of the, of, in the different roles that they have. So companies in the top quartile of gender diversity on executive teams were 25% more likely to experience above average profitability than peer companies in the fourth quartile. Now, the impact of ethnic and cultural diversity, um, it was found that companies in the top quartile outperformed those in the fourth quartile by 46%. So having gender diversity increases the likelihood of, having above, of having above average performance financially by 25%, the impact of ethnic and cultural diversity on top of gender, uh, or like separated from gender diversity is 46%. So it's much higher. And my guess would be because if you bring, uh, for example, women who are very traditionally American and women who do not come from a different background such as myself, then they're likely to think in the same way that the men think in the same areas. If, you know, if they grew up with a similar background, you likely saw the same TV shows, your families likely had the same um, set of norms and values and things that they followed, et cetera. So if you bring someone from a different country, you might have an expanded um, mindset of, oh, hey, we could do these things and that in my country we do or like myself, you know, hey, I came from the food industry. I can bring you different ideas than what the insurance industry is used to. Um, so that definitely like gets a little boost. Now, if you have a low gender diversity and low ethnic and cultural diversity, the company is 27% more likely to underperform on profitability in comparison to the rest of the companies in this data set. So I think that's really, really fascinating. Now, 
here I have some more statistics from the US Bureau of Labor. And you can see here, depending on the job, uh, sorry, depending on the, uh, the insurance industry and the, the either the race or the ethnic background or, or gender, you can see different things. Now, it's important to note when looking at these things that, of course, there are Black women, there are Asian women, there are Latinas out there, and this is not supposed to like add up to 100, just like there are Black people who are living or who have been in Latin America for ages. It can also be that someone uh, who is Asian lives in Latin America and is also Latino. So you have to be careful with how uh, you look at this data. Um, but it's very interesting to see that, for example, um, certain, um, for example, for insurance carriers, you are more likely to have uh, Black or African American employees than the general insurance um, industry. So why is that? Well, one would first think, oh, that is great. However, if you look at the data desegregated by the detail occupation within insurance, so break it down by who are the underwriters, who are the sales agents, who are the people who are handling claims or processing items, um, such as people working in the certificate team or people working as just like checking policies or things that are much more transactional you'll notice that Black or African-American people are more likely to be uh, working in the insurance claims and policy uh, processing types of jobs. So while insurance carriers might have more uh, Black employees, those employees are not reaching the executive levels. Okay, so we're getting here uh, towards the end. We have a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to chat about some uh, DEI practice in the workplace. So what can we do? Because all of this sounds like, okay, well, obviously there's something that needs to be done, but where do we start? If you look at HR, for example, uh, you might have people saying, oh, hey, um, I don't want you to make me, you might have a manager say, I don't want you to make me hire someone who is Hispanic or someone who is Black. I want the I want the best candidate. And that's a common misconception. It's like, well, you'll still get the best candidate, but what we're gonna do is broaden the pool of candidates. So we're going to uh, make partnerships with more organizations out there. So for example, the Black Chamber of Commerce, and um, we're also going to uh, sponsor programs for youth in underrepresented groups and maybe do like a shadow day where in high school or even middle school, they come to the office and see what insurance is all about. It's particularly because nobody really tells you what insurance um, is. It's hard to imagine sometimes like, oh, like State Farm, like am I going to be like flow from Progressive or what, what exactly am I going to do? Um, so, you know, just bringing those, um, that knowledge into the youth and invest it investing in the youth and the education of, of these people, then you will broaden your candidate pool. Um, set myself an alarm for 445, so I will wrap up here. Um, in, uh, say for example, in, in, like in your client base, you can say, well, as far as clients goes, we're going to try to work with those organizations that we're partnering partnering with and maybe potentially have them as clients or consider different uh, insurance carriers that might be more heavily um, uh, into diverse practices and that, you know, potentially you might get also employees from your clients or employees from uh, your insurance carriers and vice versa. So, you know, just by someone broadening the pool, then you create like a surplus of, oh, hey, now we have all of these also amazing candidates, and now you'll definitely get the best, best candidate, whether it is a white person, a male or not. And again, you know, um, this is not about bashing white people. This is not about bashing men. It's just about giving opportunities to others and just bringing them to the same level. So if they're, if they're, um, um, 
equally capable or even more capable, then it's like, oh, hey, well, we can extend the hand to both of these people, or maybe, you know, this person is particularly more uh, experienced of what we want, so we'll choose this person, whether it is, uh, again, whether it's a woman or whether it's a man, uh, a man, um, whether they are in a wheelchair or they have a hearing impairment, impairment, et cetera. So there are different ways that you can um, do this, you know, changing your, your wording on your handbook, making sure that you are adding um, men to the maternity leave. So it's not just maternity leave, you also get paternity leave. If you adopt uh, a kid, then that could also be included in these practices. And, and in that way, you're creating a more equal uh, footing for everyone. Um, so I know we're going to go into breakout rooms and you can discuss anything you would like as far as diversity, but here are some suggestions. And number one would be how diverse is your inner circle? So, you know, your, you know, you're just your besties, like how diverse are they? And uh, how diverse is the group of social media influencers that you follow online, if you follow any? And number two would be I am and I am, but I am not. An example is I am Latina. I love dancing. I absolutely love dancing, but I do not like spicy food. So common misconceptions uh, or common stereotypes of Latinas. It's like, yes, I do love dancing. However, I don't like spicy food and there's nothing wrong with either of these and I don't have to fit a mold, but you know, it's just important to um, bring these into the conversation to like break the stereotypes. Anyhow, uh, number three, do you recall a time when you noticed that the microaggression, that when you noticed a microaggression aggression in that it wasn't called out? All right, there we go. <laughs> all right, guys, so please give it just a second. I believe Sarah's gonna uh, put us all into some breakout rooms here real quick, and then we can get rocking and rolling with our suggested discussion topics. Thanks so much for a great uh, presentation, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Alrighty. So real quick, just taking a look here. We still have about 10 participants. Um, so Caleb, do you want me to break us into like groups of like, um, where you, Anna and Harina are leading and there's an even number in each group. Does that work? Perfect. That works fantastic. That way we have an officer in each meeting to kind of guide things for a little bit. Sounds good. Thanks for bearing with me just a moment while I open this up right quick. Perfect. Awesome. And then Sylvia, I'll throw you in one as well. If that sounds all right. And actually, what I'll do is I'll do two rooms. So I'll have Caleb and Sylvia in one, and then Anna and Harin in the second one. Okay. In just a moment, you will get a pop up. Hold on just a second. Sarah, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. Um, and in just a moment, you're gonna get a pop-up on your screen to join the breakout room. And you will have to accept it in order to go in. And if you don't, then you won't go in. And awesome, see you guys in a little bit. And Hadi, you can stay in here. 
All right. Thanks. Thanks again for being on today. Yeah, no problem. You're gonna get a uh, John and Will and all for the future ones. So awesome. Thank you. Yep. Is that everybody back now? I believe so. Looks like everyone's back. Perfect. I hope you guys had as good a discussion as we had in our group. I thought that was that was really cool. And those questions that you prepared for us were Awesome. So yeah, thank you so much. So just with the last like 60 seconds of the meeting today, guys, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to thank Miss Sylvia Taylor. Uh, it was incredibly obvious and apparent the amount of time and preparation and effort that you put into uh, meeting with us today. And that was just a fantastic presentation, Sylvia. So I really do appreciate, like I said, your time, effort, your preparation, and your presence today with us in this meeting. So if everybody wouldn't mind giving Miss Sylvia a quick round of applause. A big thank you for joining us okay. today, Miss Sylvia. Take a bow, flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys all, all benefited from the meeting today like I did. This is a really fun time with you guys today. So thank you so much to everybody who gave us your time and participation. Thank you, guys. And, uh, if, if I may say something like a last closing remarks. Definitely. All right. Um, so... Obviously, this was a very, very introductory um, type of meeting. Uh, so don't think that this is all there is to diversity. There's definitely extremely different topics that, that we could cover. Um, but I wanted to give you something to just get you started on that journey if you haven't started your own journey yet. And, um, you know, try, try to get that going in your own personal life. I was sharing in uh, our breakout room that I have found through social media, a lot of people who are very out outspoken about uh, their own particular marginalized groups, like someone from Hawaii, which I have learned that it's supposed to be pronounced Hawaii. Um, so, you know, take this as a springboard to, to learn and take that responsibility to yourself. And whenever you go somewhere, always question who isn't here and why how do we change that how can i change that um also you know if um you're thinking of saying something to someone or someone says something to you and you feel like oh that sounded a little bit weird and i don't know why even though it was kind of a compliment think to yourself would this have been said to anyone else or about anyone else other than someone who looks like me or, you know, is part of whatever group I am part of. Uh, same with whatever you say to other people. Consider, would I have said this to someone who is white? Would I have said this to someone who is, um, you know, not in college or someone who is able-bodied or some, et cetera? You know, you get my point. Just, you know, ask yourself questions to, um, to learn for yourself because just because you might belong to a marginalized group, it doesn't mean that the work ends there. I can, I can definitely tell you that I've learned so much and there's so much more to learn. And then apply that knowledge to help bring people to a point where they can be their most authentic selves in all aspects of their life, especially at work because we spend so much time at work. It's a, um, it's a little sad that sometimes we don't uh, feel like we can be ourselves. And thank you again for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Miss Sylvia, as well. I appreciate you. Thank you. Well, Before guys, that, that is a wrap for our deep. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Anna. I just wanted to ask you if it's okay with everyone if I can take a group picture um, as this is the last event of our semester to put on our social media page. Perfect, thank you. Okay, three, two, one.
Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. You have a wonderful rest of your day, okay? Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me.